Hi, I'm Rando from Rando's ESL Cyber Listening Lab, providing tips on language learning, culture, and human development. And I think finding ways to keep students engaged, attentive in the classroom and in virtual learning environments can be a, can be a real challenge. I mean, students turn off their cameras and sometimes we have to find ways of having them feel engaged in what we're doing. And I think this is all too common in the what we call the new normal, where we're trying to find meaningful ways of, as I mentioned, to stay engaged, to, for, to learn language and so forth. And in this episode today, I am happy to have Nelia Monte, uh, a language teaching specialist from Argentina, who's going to be talking about her evolution as a language instructor and the importance of games in the language classroom. So let me go ahead and bring on our guest today. And uh, welcome, Nelia, to our broadcast. Hello, everybody. How are you? <laughs> so, uh, Nelia, just like every time when I introduce a, a guest uh, to the broadcast, we start out with introducing themselves. And just so people know, we'll talk about uh, basic introduction. And we're going to talk about Argentina and her, and her people. So right. let's go ahead and <laughs> start this out and uh, just go ahead and introduce yourself. Well, this is my family. I have them all quiet now. I'm at home, so you can imagine Sunday. <laughs> it's 1 p.m. here, almost lunchtime. Everybody's quiet back there, so I'm grateful for that. We should all be very grateful to our families who are putting up with us, teaching at home. <laughs> uh, so these are my husband, Juan Pablo, and my children, Nicolás, who is 20, and Santiago, who is 15, my pride and joy, the apple of my eye, what can I say? Super. Thank you, Amelia. And one of the things that we want to talk about is Argentina. And oh, before we actually get into yeah. that, perhaps you can make reference to some of the work yes. that you're doing, where you work, where you yeah. teach, and so forth. Okay. Well, Randall was teasing me a minute ago about uh, taking off my glasses. <laughs> and this tells you how old I am. I've been teaching for 30 years already. I'm an experienced teacher, you can say, but a very young one. <laughs> Um, I work at Nueva Escuela Argentina 2000, where I am the head of the English department. I also work for Escuela de Maestros, which is a program ran by the government of the city of Buenos Aires, where I teach teachers neurosciences and education. I also work at ICANA, which is a binational American Argentinian school of English, where I teach English. And my baby, you can see it there, my book, uh, which was published uh, actually now three years ago. Uh, thick book on games, which took us six years to put together. And some of the ideas we, we, sh we shared here in the book will be shared today in the broadcast. So, okay. And thank you. And thank you again. Uh, uh, Magdalena says, hi, Nelia. Fantastic. Games galore is wonderful. Perhaps. Oh, you know it. One, oh, yeah, Magdalena. Hello. She's from Argentina. <laughs> She's one of yeah. our first followers. So good to see you. Right. <laughs> Well, great. And again, we have uh, people from Israel. We have people from Tunisia right. joining us today. So let's go ahead and get right into the broadcast. One of the things that when people think about Argentina, when they think about their particular regions of the world, I think it's really mm -hmm. important for people to understand the diversity, not only of culture, of geography, of, of nature, but also the diversity of language teaching situations and environment. Yes. And we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. So let's just spend a couple of minutes talking about uh, Argentina. And so yeah. people can understand the diversity of your country. Of course. Well, it's a beautiful country to come visit. So you're all invited when all this is over <laughs> and frontiers are open. Uh, Argentina is the southernmost uh, country in America. We actually... I uh, have the southernmost city in the world, which is Ushuaia. There's no other city, uh, you know, more southern than that, which is also beautiful to visit. And it's a country which has a lot of diversity. I don't know if you want to move on to the next uh, sure. slide where, you know, there was and a Nelia, campaign. If I, could, if I could just jump in here, when you said in America, that's one of the th important South America, people. yeah. <laughs> no, but it's really important for people to realize that when they talk, uh, I remember years ago, I was living in South America and I told people, 
I'm from America. And they said, <laughs> we are too. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> I, think I think it's really important for people outside of the Americas to be aware that you're American, I'm American. And we, uh, we, we share that geographical, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, expanse. So yeah, let's the talk thing, about the Argentina. Thing is yeah, the thing is that you use American as a nationality, but we are American because that's our continent. <laughs> right. And so well, Argentina has been called the country of the six continents. That's what it says there in Spanish. As you can see, our language is Spanish, native language. That's our flag. And why is that? Because really in Argentina, it's such a long country, very, very long country. And, and you've got lots of varieties, as Randall will show you. Well, my country probably you're familiar with Pope Francis. Argentina is mostly Catholic, and there's there's of course a lot of religions here, lots of Protestants and and, and Jewish people, Muslim people, and there's a, a very um, very good atmosphere that is there's a lot of respect. But mostly Argentina is majority of the population is Catholic. Uh, we have our Pope and Messi, all right, the football player, and then also. It's the land of mate. Mate is a drink, a kind of tea that we have. It's very common in Argentina. Everybody loves it. Not just in Argentina, Argentina, Paraguay, Brazil, we all drink mate. Dulce de leche is like a milk caramel, great. And alfajores, it's a treat you need to try. All right. All right. So let's talk about this diversity of the land. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is in the north. These are the Iguazu Falls. Um, it's one of the uh, of the biggest expanses of, of waterfalls in the world. It's absolutely stunning, marvelous. It's in the middle of the jungle, so you should go visit. There's a lot of uh, um, wildlife there, and it's a beautiful place to visit. That's in the north. In the north, but to the west, to the mountains, you see this kind of, uh, of landscape similar to what you might have, I don't know, in, in Colorado or I imagine, or, or in the Grand in Canyon, Utah. in this Utah, yeah. It looks like Utah. <laughs> yeah, so because we also have deserts and very, very high mountains, you know, we've got the Andes and you can see landscapes very dry like this one's on the other, you know, this is in the north, but to the west. Yeah. You know, and to beautiful, the east, you've beautiful. got a, a, a waterfall, a, a waterfalls in a, in a rainforest. So you've got big variety. All right. And, and then, then if you move, talk about yeah, the other region. yeah, going down the Andes, this is a bit, uh, this is a, an area we call Cusho, which is an area of the country where there are great wines. Argentina is world famous for its wines. Mm. We've got our own kinds of wines. For example, you should try Malbec. It's one of the best wines in Argentina if you're a wine lover that are beautiful, uh, you know, excursions, you know, tours where you can go see the, the, the vineyards and, and try great uh, wines and end up a little tipsy. <laughs> well, that, I mean, those mountains, again, look like Utah as well. I mean, I yeah. mean very comfortable. Yeah. And, uh, and then, right. and then to the right, if you go, you know, to the, to, to uh, the east, then in the center, in the central area of the country that are acres and acres and acres of grasslands, Argentina, grasslands, sorry, Argentina is very well known for agriculture for cattle, those there are our gauchos. Is there is the Argentinian version for your cowboys? You know, <laughs> <laughs> and this is far in the south. In the south, you'll see beautiful, stunning places full of beautiful uh, lakes and mountains, ski resorts, which are also world famous. Oh. This is a hotel very well known called uh, Xiao Xiao, a super luxurious hotel uh, embedded in the middle of the mountains in one of the most beautiful cities, in my opinion, in the world, which is Mariloche. Wow, <laughs> wow. And this looks and this like is, the Alps. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, but this is actually Mount Fitzroy, uh, also there in, in the city of, uh, of Neuquén, which is down south. Uh, very, very beautiful, yeah. Oh, wow. And then let's talk more. Oh, and this is far south, far south in the province of Santa Cruz in the in the border with chile we've got a huge huge area of glaciers this glacier here is called perito moreno it has been named uh, world heritage by unesco it's a huge 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 piece of ice of about the size of the whole city of buenos aires wow. uh it's really stunning it's breathtaking you should go and visit in addition to that i know there's a lot of coastal yeah areas, yeah, yeah 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 because to the to the west, um, our limit, our border is the Andes. And to the east, it's mostly all along the country, the Atlantic. 
And so we've got thousands of kilometers of beautiful beaches where you can also see lots of wildlife. Like here, this is Ballena Franca, a Franca whale that you can see um, in a certain months of the year from September to, I think, November or December in Puerto Madryn, which is a beautiful area where you can also see the next slide. You'll see some other uh, animals you can also see in that area. Very, very beautiful place to go see tours. And you can see there in the boat, you can see them right next to you because they are curious and they come to see you. <laughs> well, that's shared. That's a lot. I know also you uh, wanted to mention that you're from Buenos yeah, Aires. Yeah, because this is my city. This is where I was born. It's a huge city because you've got all that nature, but you also have huge cities. Um, Buenos Aires uh, is, a, is, a, is a great, uh, beautiful metropolis where you can see a, a lot of different things as well. Wow. And eat Again. very, very well. You can eat. Okay. There are As we get in, uh, we're just looking at, again, some uh, greetings from Tunisia, Hi, from Tunisia. Monterey, Mexico, Ricardo, Mongia Hi. from Argentina, uh, Sudip also from Nepal. So oh. uh, wonderful people are joining. Well, a lot of people are going to ask before we get into talking about games and engagement and so forth. People often ask, well, how did you get into language teaching? A lot of people <laughs> have different paths. If you could share that for a moment. Okay, well, I actually, it was just a coincidence, one of those great coincidences God sends into your life, because I was actually studying psychology. I am a psychologist as well, specialized in neuroscience, and I was studying psychology. I was very, very young. I already had a very good level of English, and my last year English teacher, I mean, I was about to graduate from my course of studies in English, she opened up a school of languages here in, in Argentina, especially in big cities, there are lots of language centers to learn English, you know, it's very common. And so she opened the school and she said, hey, would you like to come teach? I was just 19 years old. I had no idea about teaching, no idea. And I said, well, okay, I've always been adventurous. So I said, well, okay, let's do it. And I fell in love with it instantly. I fell in love with the classroom. So uh, after some years, you know, I was in second year of psychology. When I graduated five years later, next year I started the teacher training college and I, just worked as psychologist for a very short time, I mean, clinically speaking. And then I plunged into teaching and had been teaching for 30 years already. And I'm so happy about that decision. <laughs> Great. And what I'd like to do now is I'd like to shift the topic just briefly. Many people are asking around the mm. world, you know, the impact of the pandemic on personal and professional life mm. as teacher and students. If you could briefly speak to the situation, again, we realize Argentina is a very big country. Yeah, there's a, a diversity of landscape, but also of educational situations. If you yes. could briefly speak to the impact of the pandemic there, and that will lead us into our topic for today on. Yeah. OK, well, yeah, you know, last year was a very tough year for education here in Argentina. Schools were literally closed all year, all year long. All schools all around the country were closed which meant we had to instantly shift to online where it was possible. Because as you said very well in Argentina, there's a, there's a lot of inequality, you know, a lot of inequality. Um, and so there are people who are privileged and have access to internet, good computers and, and technology, and many, many children in Argentina are not. But I have to say that teachers here work very hard and they found a way they found a way to make things get to students. Sometimes it was, you know, going house by house, sending the material. In rural schools, for example, teachers would go, you know, take their horse and take the material children to children. But of course, there was a lot of loss and we cannot deny that. So this right. year we're trying to make up for all the loss. It was hard for teachers and for children. You know, virtual education is not mainly thought of for children. It's not an environment which is you know, we can stay so adequate for children. And so we had to learn a lot from one day to the other, but something great that happened here in Argentina is that we worked as a team. We teachers teamed up, up together, we helped each other, you know, we shared our skills, everybody was very generous and we survived, but it wasn't easy. And now we're having a dual system. Uh, you know, because we need to keep distance. There are very strict protocols, very strict protocols in schools. And so many schools are not big enough to hold the whole class because yeah. students are very close to one another. So we have to divide them, you know, split the classes in two groups. 
So they have one week of virtual, one week of uh, classroom classes, or if it's a double shift, they go one shift virtual and the other shift classroom classes. And some teachers are teaching virtual, some teachers are, te are teaching classroom classes. So it's a mixture, a dual system. All right, and, and thank you for sharing that because I think, like I said, so many people are struggling to find a balance, what is working, what is not, working yeah. in cities versus rural areas. Like recently we had a guest, Sudeep from Nepal in his city, very limited internet at all in, yeah. in schools, none. And so yeah. certainly we want to keep yeah. that in mind. This is going to now lead into our discussion for today. And this is what uh, you and I, Nelia, would like to extend to our audience. We're talking about games and how we can increase engagement in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So we would be interested as Nelia, you and I are speaking on this. First of all, for the teachers out there, share with us some of the challenges that you're having in your own classroom. The challenges of keeping students attentive and engaged mm. and the types of activities, whether they are games of any nature, what are some of the things that you're doing both in face-to-face and online learning environments. So let's go okay. ahead and lead into this. And kind of the theme, uh, Nelia, and for everyone, is how can games help students learn language, culture, and just human development, you know, just mm -hmm. understanding mm -hmm. themselves. Mm -hmm. So if you could, Nelia, just tell us a little bit about your foray, your, your jumping into the whole realm of games, how that began, and then we're going mm -hmm. to talk about yeah. some specific activities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, um, actually, if you think of children, if we're talking about children, games is an absolute must do. You cannot do away with game if you're a uh, game, sorry, in the classroom. Whatever thing you're teaching, I mean, what happens? I'm going to ask you, Randall, what happens? Let's imagine you have two children who don't know each other. They get together. What do you think they will do after two minutes? <laughs> what will they do? <laughs> I don't know. It could be chaos. You no, never know. They will start playing. They will start playing <laughs> games because that's hopefully, the natural. Hopefully. Yeah, they will start playing. That's the thing that they will naturally do because that's what children do. That's how, you know, children. Um, how can I say, learn, acquire the world, uh, learn how to relate to each other, learn how to live in the world, learn through games naturally. That's what happens naturally. I was just in thinking, the classroom. Yeah. yeah. I, was, I was just thinking last night, my grandson and I were making cookies. We made uh, 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 M&M cookies. <laughs> and I was thinking when I mentioned chaos, I was thinking of when you get two kids together in the kitchen, with a, oh, well, that's in the with kitchen. A, <laughs> with a boatload of cookies, who knows what will happen. So I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt. Well, let me tell you, Randall, you're bringing up a topic, uh, something interesting to share. You, you can't expect games in the classroom to be all orderly and quiet. No, playing games is noisy. Playing games can be messy. Of course, you need to establish rules and you need to have a very good classroom management if you're not a good really? teacher in terms of classroom management well okay games will flunk as well oh. so there are there need to be rules uh, order but it's messy and noisy that's what games are like that's okay and yeah. we're going to speak about this i know that you have your book that you've written yeah, you yeah, here about is. that and then we'll get into <laughs> the activities for today okay well this is a a, a book that, you know, what happened to me is like, I always used games from the very beginning. As I told you, I first, I started being a teacher, working as a teacher without being certified, you know, at the beginning. I, it's just because I had a good level of English. And then I studied pedagogy, even though I was studying psychology, you know, and I simply by experience, I realized that, you know, games uh, was a very sensible thing to do in the class, you know, just as a, of course, I'm not talking about playing all the time, you know, incorporating yeah. activities, game-like activities or games, because there are two things, game-like activities and games, games with rules, I mean, you know, board games or card games. Uh, and then I tried to adapt even uh, book activities, you know, course book activities into, and, and I gave them an element of fun, an, an element of game, like a, uh, a time limit or a competition or something that would turn, you know, any regular activity into game. 
And so I became a fan of games. I have a huge collection of, of books of games, of course, to teach English at home. And after some years, I got together with a colleague and it took us six years. We put together this book where you have um, almost 500 ideas of games. This is my team, actually. Uh, uh, Natalia, the, the, the one who's wearing a, a, a black T-shirt, a black sweater, is the co-author. And then the other two are my sisters. It's a family project. Very talented graphic designer and illustrator who were in charge of putting together all the beautiful. Um, this book is beautiful in, from the point of view of uh, you know design and and illustrations. I mean, uh, and it took a long time, six years to put together because as you can see, it has more than five hundred pages. It's a big book. <laughs> Great. And all the material is ready. I mean. What, what, I, what we wanted to do is to make it easy for teachers to include games in class. You know, here, I don't know in the States, but here in Argentina, you saw in my presentation how many jobs I have. Well, that's the usual thing in Argentina. Teachers don't make a lot. And so to make ends meet, you need to have two, three, four jobs sometimes. And that means you don't have so much time to plan extra activities, even though you would love to. And so we said, okay, listen, this works. This is great. We believe in that because we see it happening in the classroom. The children learn through games, learn much more than through any other given activity. And so, but we need to help teachers. So that was the idea. It took us hundreds of hours so that it will save you hundreds of hours <laughs> because all the material is ready. Well, great. And let's just, uh, just uh, some comments are coming in right here. We have Neshmi, uh, good morning. Greetings from Costa Rica. Hi, Costa Rica, Rica right? Good. Uh, I wish I could have, could have been there. Beautiful Argentina. Oh, yeah. Come visit. It's beautiful. Uh, you won't regret it. it. Yeah. Hello. Uh, <laughs> again, we have some other, uh, we mentioned, uh, again, Argentina, outstanding magic. Uh, Sudip says, so captivating. I think he's speaking specifically of Argentina. Uh, Victor from... Uh, from uh, Mexico is sharing and right. saying hello. Um, right. Also, Kayla from Costa Rica says hello from Costa Rica. It's always great to hear voices from different places around the world, very enriching. And I think that's what we're speaking to is the yeah. different variety of experiences that people have. And, you know, a lot of people are saying, hey, isolation impacted me emotionally. And I oh, think yeah. what we're yeah. trying to say, too, is even with these games and activities, they can provide yeah. some support with that. Uh, yeah, again, actually, uh, may, may I mention something about yeah. that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, may I? Uh, what we're noticing that here in Argentina, after literally a year of not having classroom classes, is that children are finding it difficult to, how can I put it, to put up with the long hours of being in school, even if even if they are half the time they used to be. You know, I work in a school which is double shift, which means students used to go to school from 8 to 4.30. Now they're going just three hours. Yeah. They cannot, they cannot stand that. They are so tired after two hours because being at home in isolation changed. Uh, and, and they are finding it difficult now to relate to each other, to to concentrate in the activities. And that's why games are so much more relevant nowadays than, you know, in previous, in the in the old normal, let's say. Absolutely. And there's some other comments that Monhia says, even in classrooms, we have to accept a bit of chaos. Yeah, yes. And um, uh, Mag Magdalena says, even adults love playing well, games. Yeah. Magda, Magda is from Argentina. She's one of our first followers. Hi, Magda. Again, yes, love the adults love playing games. I was saying that if, the, if they are children, they, it's an absolute must. But with adults, you should try playing games. They are so competitive, worse yeah. than children. <laughs> Absolutely. And Taylor from Costa Rica says, playing games in the classroom is definitely a great way to engage students. Yeah. In my case, since I teach high school students and adults, it's my Achilles heel. Yeah. Loves doing it. Uh, <laughs> student says students enjoy games. Yeah, they do. Uh, again, to, someone from Tunisia saying, interesting. Uh, hello from Greece and from Jorge from Tampico. So welcome, everyone. Well, let's just get right. Thank you, everyone, for sharing those greetings. Also, the role of games in your classroom. Feel free to share the types of games, websites, resources that you're using, 
And we're just going to go ahead and jump into this, Nelia. Yeah. All right. Let's play, man. Because actually, right. that's what they're here for. They want to. They want the good things, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. And so we're going to start with games for younger oh. learners, and then we're going to move on to some activities for adult learners. And some yeah. of you, again, as I mentioned, any websites, any resources that we have, we posted some in the show notes. Feel free to share. So let's go ahead and start, Nelia. Yeah, well, actually, I'm going to refer to one of the questions you had in the previous section where people were asking you some questions and they asked you about yoga and movement. But let me tell you that movement from the point of view of the neurosciences, and this is the psychologist in me uh, talking, uh, movement is essential. If we're talking about young children, you cannot have them sitting in the classroom for hours without moving. And that applies also for online lessons where you have them 40, 50 minutes sitting in front of a computer. That is an absolute uh, mistake. You shouldn't have children sitting for a very long time. So you have to include games. And it's not just moving during break or during physical education. No, you can include games with movement in the classroom for the purpose of learning English. And so this is, uh, in the book, there's a huge section of games that include movement because teachers are not so much used to including games with movement to teach English. So this is a very good example that I'm going to show you. Of course, this is not a mute hopscotch. This is a language hopscotch. Yeah, kinesthetic learning, absolutely, yeah. So if you move on to the next slide, you will see how you can adapt a regular hopscotch to a language activity. This is a kinder group. As you can see, the faces of the children have been blurred, even though we have permission from the parents to use these pictures, the faces have been blurred, so um, we protect their identities. But we wanted to show you how you play it so much clearer if you see the picture. So simply, you know, hopscotch, I don't need to explain it. What I need to explain is how you adapt it to being a language activity. As you can see here, there are flashcards next to each of the steps of the hopscotch you know, from, from earth to sky, you go in the hopscotch. And so what children should do is you put, this is an example with clothes, for example, but you can use also, uh, let me show you some flashcards, you know, um, parts of the body, or you could use, uh, if you're learning, I don't know, parts of the house, whichever vocabulary right. you're learning, you need to have that material. The book has a lot of flashcards, but you can make your own. Or in this case, they have been colored by the children themselves. They love making their own materials. And so you place the flashcards and the child has to jump along saying the words, saying the words. You may need to add, help them out because sometimes they freeze in front of, of, the, of the beginning of the hopscotch. So you can whisper the word, help them. You want them to succeed. That's something important about games is you want children to succeed and to have a pleasant experience. Yeah. So do Absolutely. never, never overexpose them. Never be there to help. And this is not a competition. Children have to jump along and say the words. If you go to the next slide, I'll show you how you can play. Uh, well, you can see them there jumping and you see uh, the teacher is there helping. You see how she's helping. And she's probably so playing too. Yeah. She's, she's helping the child in scaffolding. Go to the next one, please, and you will see sure. how you can play this game with large classes. Another cardinal rule when you play games is kill a game before it dies. So it shouldn't be a very long game. You know, by, by rule, uh, if you think of children, think of their age and add, for example, if a child is seven years old, add two more minutes. A game or an activity shouldn't be longer than nine minutes. For a six-year-old, eight minutes. For a 10-year-old, 12 minutes, you know? So you should cut down your activities a bit. So how do you do it? In this case, if it's a large class, as you can see here, you put two hopscotch cords and children jump at the same time. The, the flashcards are in the middle, as you can see. In this case, it's not just vocabulary. In this case, this was second grade and they are working on present continuous. You put flashcards with actions and they have to say sentences like for example wow. she's walking he's running they are eating she's drinking you know and of course you are there to help in this case since they are older children it's a competition so if they jump along the whole hopscotch court having said all the sentences correctly they win a point for their team and then they go back to the line and the, the first one goes forward you can also play it in the classroom this is in the playground but okay um one of the things I just want to jump in here, and I know we're leading right into 
online learning environments. We're going to talk yeah. about that, how it can be transitioned. One yeah. of the things that Maria says, I recycle anything I have into a game. <laughs> Great idea. Be creative. So, yeah. So whatever you might have. And that's what, for those that are watching the broadcast, feel free to share things that you're doing, recycling, yeah. using, yeah. repurposing, Absolutely. and so forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great idea. Thank you, Maria. Great. Actually, you can play this game online. And I have actually, last year I had a kinder. Imagine that the... Randall, let me share a, a challenge I had last year. I had to teach a group of five-year-olds whom I had never seen in my life. Because here at Icana, where I work, classes started in April and the lockdown started mid-March. Oh, wow. So I had to teach a group of five-year-olds I had never seen in my entire life. Uh, life. We ended up being totally in love with each other. Yeah. So the human capacity of establishing bonds is magnificent. And you need to play all the time online as well. So right. how do you play this game online? You don't need to have, you know, when you play in the classroom, you can, as you can see here, you can draw or you can make, you can draw on the floor if the school allows you, or you can make this rectangles of paper and to, to make the hopscotch court. But when you play at home, you don't need this. You don't need to, you don't need this. So do you want me to show you how you play at home? Uh, well, let's try that. Okay, so probably you can stop sharing so because okay. you, you need to see me. <laughs> well, let me go ahead. Let me focus on you then. You're, you're the star. <laughs> okay, so what you need is, as you said, as I showed you, flashcards of different areas of vo vocabulary. In this case, for example, parts of the body. So what you will tell the children is put the flashcards on the floor on a line, you know, one next to the other. Okay. And they will have to jump along using one foot, two feet, one foot, two feet, one foot, saying the word. So uh, I don't know if you can hear me, Randall. You tell me if it's okay. We can hear you. Okay, so you go. Mouth, nose, face, you know, ears. Mm -hmm. And what you do when you play at home is you give children some time for them to make their own hopscotch court on the floor, you know, and they can... Even if you have a class of 20 children, which is the case of 30, they are all, you have the microphones off and you call volunteers to say their hopscotch words or sentences, because you can also use this as prompts. Now I'll show you how you can do it with, with chunks of, of language. Um, and you open the microphone of one given child who volunteers and they, they say the words just for everybody and then they take turns. If you have a smaller group, like in, I was lucky at Ikan, I only had seven students. I had the chance to make everybody participate. But if you have a large class, just a few, and then all the others are doing it because children love it. Even when the class finishes, they will keep on jumping and saying the words. You can also use this, for example, with food, saying I like, I don't like. Like, I like bananas, I don't right. like apples, I like uh, sandwiches, I don't like pizza, you know? Or with I can or I can't with actions. I can, I can't, I've got, for example, with toys, I have got, I haven't got. And so they make the sentences personal and you're practicing both chunks of language, which is typical with young uh, students. They learn, you know, chunks of language just by repeating and the vocabulary as well or simply use it to practice vocabulary as a lexical game. All right, Nelia, thank you very much for sharing that. I know, and I, I think both of us would be interested in finding out what are other teachers doing in their classes from games, but yeah. also really large classes. Like yeah. some people have, I have 150 students in my class. Oh How can yeah. I do games? I'm not saying that we need to speak to that right now. We're gonna go on with our presentation. But okay. any of you working with really large classes, what is working for you? Let's talk about the this uh, next activity. Well, yeah, this is a, say, a smaller version or more controlled version of, of hopscotch, which is called finger hopscotch. Of course, in the book, you have this uh, worksheet that you can see, but you can make it on your own as well. And in the book, you also have the cards that are exactly the same size because you need smaller cards to put next to um, the um, each of the steps of the hopscotch. The idea is exactly basically the same, but instead of jumping, children use their fingers. Children, and let me tell you, Randall, you can use this with adults. I've played this game with adults and they wanted to take the, the board home. They wanted to practice some more, you know? <laughs> 
<laughs> Sometimes you 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 know adults also love to when you when you tap the child in their souls, you know, they love it. Yep, that is great. I think that's yeah, cool. yeah. So they simply go jumping, you know. I don't know, banana, apple. You need to put next to each of the steps of the hopscotch carts of whichever area the content is up to you. Uh, and uh, and they follow the same procedure. And in this case, you see, this is a picture taken before uh, before new normal. You can see how close children are from each other. Nowadays, this is not possible. Right. But they can play because now in Argentina, I don't know there, but in Argentina, they are a meter and a half away from each other. But you can see your your classmates bored. Yeah, so, and you can hear your classmate from a meter away. So they simply jump and they play in pairs, taking turns, and they can change the cards themselves. It's simply a drilling exercise disguised as a game. Well, wonderful. And I, I have uh, Lena. Uh, yeah, oh, sorry, sorry. sorry. There, was, there was a video of this one. I don't know if you could download it. Uh, um, I don't have it right now. Ah, okay, uh, okay, okay, okay. Okay. Uh, Lena mentions, how can we buy the book? We'll mention that at the very end. Uh, Monhia says, how can we implement games to motivate pupils to be more engaged in reading and writing activities? So not just this, but I want to do a game for a writing class. Or Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. There are many games. Even you can include a game as a trigger for a writing activity. For example, there's a, I don't know if I can do this. Can I, Randall, sh share a game? to trigger writing. Do we have time? Um, let's go ahead if we can go <laughs> okay. on and hopefully we can come back. But I okay. think, Monia, I think that's really important of doing different activities, yeah. reading the writing. People that are watching the broadcast, feel free to share your ideas on that. And if we have time, we'll come back. If okay. not, perhaps you can respond through Facebook regarding of that course, question. Of course, of course. Monia, uh, excellent question, so forth. And Natalia says this, the book is wonderful. We'll mention that near the end. <laughs> Let's go on to some other activities. Okay. Yeah. Well, actually, Randall, you asked me also for some games you can use with adults. Even though I mentioned, you know, games that you would think are mostly for children, you can adapt them and they love it. This is mostly for teenagers or adults because this implies a higher level of language and, and mostly grammar. This is a grammar game. Take a cross. Let's continue. Well, as you can see, this is a this is a, an example of a of a worksheet that you have in the book. But what you actually need in order to play this game, I don't know if you can stop sharing so that I can show the audience sure, something. No problem. Yeah? yeah. All right. So what you actually need, even if you don't have the book, is for your students to have cards with a tick and a cross. You know, tick a cross. That's what they need. Yeah. And so why? Because. You need to have also sentences, as you can see here. If you move on to the next one, they'll probably be able to see it. Uh, no, not the, the following one, the following this one. This one right here. Yeah, this one. Probably yeah. they are able to read. I don't know. If it, for me, without the glasses, it's absolutely, you know, ants. But probably you can read it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. So here you see, in this case, this is a simple past example. But again, the content is up to you. You can use it even, even for um, common errors to check homework. Uh, whatever, you know? And I so, think you had to, oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's the online version. Yeah, so let me show, let me explain first how you play and then probably right. we can go to the pictures. Great. Um, so how do you play? You need to have a set of sentences, some of which are correct, some of which are incorrect. In this case, there's a collection of 15 sentences, all in the simple past, because we're working on simple past here, and some of them contain mistakes. Um, some of them are very common mistakes. The mistakes, uh, some of these, uh, actually all these games have been, um, you know, the product of a lot of years of experience. So you, you come across the same mistakes year after year, you know, and after a while, you know what, what mistakes, especially if students come from the same background, like in our case, they all speak Spanish. Uh, and so we know the mistakes that will, they will make. So <laughs> these are the types of things you will find here in the book. So what they have to do is you need a die, uh, any kind of die, like the one I'm showing you here, or uh, if you're That's working online. Yeah, if you're working online, you can also use, uh, ah, let me share with you something very interesting. There's an online um, dice, if you, if you play this game online, which is called free online dice. Okay. Free online dice. I don't know if you, uh, this is a, 
it's um sort of it, it's a, it's not even an app it works online and you can i'm trying to look uh look it up here free online die so that i can show you well you need a die the die is in order for you to have a number so that you know which sentence imagine i throw the die and i have i don't know five and then i throw it again and i have five so then ten so you should everybody read sentence 10 if you can <laughs> so it says here tom where at the park at five o'clock okay so once they have all read give them time don't rush students when they play games once they have all played uh, sorry read you tell them okay one two three and then you can follow you can show the next slide or the previous sure. slide sorry please no no problem you see this is no the previous one the previous one the, the one oh, that I'm had sorry. the students in the here. classroom yeah here. here here so this is what students will do they will flash the card if, if they think the sentence is correct, they will flash a tick. If they think the sentence is incorrect, they will flash a cross. As you can see here, well, I don't know if you can see it clearly, uh, some students are, are flashing crosses and some students are flashing uh, ticks. So what you need to do is you need to have your class divided in teams. As you can see here, they are sitting in rows. So each row is a team. So you sum up the amount of correct choices. And that's the score the team will get. Great. Of course, that's you need idea. to have, yeah, you need to have the exact same number of students per team. Otherwise, it's not fair, right? Students love this game. Let, and let's see, we can we can also play it online. Probably you can go to that next slide there. You can you see this game played with adults. I was telling you this is great with adults. Um, and so you you follow the same procedure, but what they have to do is flash the card in front of the camera you know if it's a small class like the one you can see here which is five students you don't even need to divide them in teams it's simply a question of playing and having fun and then of course you analyze why is it that the sentence was wrong you talk about the grammar and so on and so forth this is a great example uh, of game to make your own material for example with common errors from a piece of homework for example you you make your own sentences based on mistakes Great, and it sounds like uh, you can adjust it depending on the need, the oh, level of course. complexity, yeah, 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 and so yeah, forth. Yeah. And Monia says, "Tick or cross, I'll give it a try." Yeah, give it a try; they will love it. That's great. All right, well, let's go on to the next. Uh, one. Okay, well, this is another. I don't need to introduce tic tac toe. I mean, everybody knows how to play tic tac toe, but this is a language tic tac toe. Uh, you can use it to play with vocabulary as a lexical game or as a grammar game. So, you know, the mechanics, I don't, do you think I need to teach it? Randall, everybody knows how to play tic-tac-toe in terms yeah, of mechanics. Yeah, within the framework of... Uh, yeah. yeah, okay. Um, it's a very famous game. Everybody plays it, you know, all over the world, but not with vocabulary, not with grammar. What you need to have is three in a row. You need to have, you know, three, the, the, the group is divided in two teams. Uh, one team is for the crosses. The other team will be the circles. And in order for the team to put their cross or their circle in the um, quadrant of the tic-tac-toe that they choose, they need to do whatever you decide. In this case, it's a vocabulary game. So they have to simply say the words. This is a game, for example, I play with kinder, but you can also play with an elementary group of adult students. Why not? And so... Um, I don't know, Randall, if you can write on top of this or not, so we can show them. I can't, no. Oh, okay. So, well, what you should do if you work online with this, if you work in the classroom, you stick the flashcards or you make drawings or you write words on the board and then the cross or the circle will be on top of the picture or you clean the picture or you remove the flashcard and you put the cross or the tick. If you play online, you can use the writing tools, uh, whichever, I mean, the, according to if you use Zoom or if you use uh, um, Meet or, or Hangouts or, I mean, or, or Big Blue Button, whichever, they right. all have their own writing tools. So you write the cross or the circle on top of the images, you know? So, for example, if I choose the central quadrant, I would say hamburger. So... Of course, give time for the team to think about the answer. If it's online, give them a moment to discuss. And once they have the final answer, they tell you the answer. If it's the other team will decide if it's correct. And then you put the cross or the circle on top of the picture. You can also use this with chunks of language like I like or I don't like 
or I have, I don't have, I can, I can't, whatever. Yeah. So a also, lot of variation. Now, yeah. Maria says right here, she says it also works with true or false after you've read a story. Absolutely. Yes. True or false is a great, great exercise after working with a reader that you're doing in class or with literature. Absolutely. Yes. Why not? Why not making your sentences based on the literature book you're reading? Absolutely. The content, what I'm teaching you here is the mechanics. And then the content is up to you because you can adapt these games even for super advanced students. I have played tic-tac-toe. Probably we can move on to the grammar tic-tac-toe yeah. if you'd like. And Eva just mentioned, she says, I've used tic-tac-toe in my class. My students yeah, love it. Ah, they love You're it. Saying, they love it. Adjusting the complexity, adjusting the purpose, adjusting the task. Certainly it's not mm -hmm. just an elementary game. Well, no, the no, actual no. mechanics is simple, but I think the type of task you can create yeah, yeah, is yeah. so varied. And I don't know, Randall, if you know this, but after playing uh, tic-tac-toe for many years, I realized that students have a technique, which is a killer to always win tic-tac-toe. I never learned it. But if you start, I don't know in which quadrant and you move on, <laughs> they always win. I don't know. <laughs> and they love, they love winning. Adults are more competitive than children. <laughs> so the grammar tic-tac-toe, as I was saying, is uh, it's the next one. You put whatever you want in the quadrants, you know, whatever. But I mean, whatever. I have used this for phrasal verbs, for idioms in super advanced classes. This is an example, for example, with simple past and present perfect. So in order for the team to be able to put their cross or circle in the given quadrant they chose, they need, in this case, to make a sentence. Choosing whether the sentence should be in the simple past or the present perfect according to the adverb there is in the quadrant. Also, they have to decide whether the sentence should be a question, a negative, or an affirmative. And this is the symbols you have, you know, question mark stands for question, cross stands for a negative sentence, tick stands for an affirmative right. one. And they also have to they also have to use the given subject pronoun. Also, you need to give them actions for this. You can have them choose their own actions, the action they want for the verb, for the sentence, or you can give them flashcards. You know, you mm -hmm. can show them a flashcard of an action. Oops, sorry, I'm showing it upside down. In this case, in this case, for example, uh, playing basketball, or uh, I don't know, playing football, or whichever action you want. You know, or run. You know, um, so. Or they can choose their own action. So, for example, let's imagine, Randall, you choose quadrant five. Got it. How, how would you make a sentence with five? Well, have they read the book yet? Okay, good. Did I, did I pass? <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, the other team, to keep everybody engaged all the time, a good idea is to ask the other team. They are the judges. You know, the other team, the one who's not making the sentence, who's not building the sentence, should decide what they think. Hmm. If the sentence was right or wrong. If they decide it was right, and, of course, you have a say in this, of course, you put your cross or your circle according to the team you are. And then it's the other team's turn. The winner is the first team that can have three in a row, be it, you know, down or across or diagonal. And I know you have this other one. This is just another example. Yeah, another the, example with simple present, present continuous. But I insist, for example, I something I do with my advanced classes uh, where you learn tons and tons of new vocabulary, which is super difficult to use because they learn, they know the meaning, but then it's difficult to use or idioms, for example. What I do is the first thing I do in the class, I always recycle, which is a great thing to do when you start a class, recycle prior knowledge. So we play tic-tac-toe, for example, or four in a row. You can make it more difficult. Instead of having three and three, you have four in a row, four, 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 which is more difficult. Um, and you put the words they learned in the previous week, for example, some words from a, from a reading activity or some uh, phrasal verb they're grappling with or some idioms, and they need to use them. In order to put their tick or cross, they need to make a correct sentence. It's a right. team team activity. And if you use it for revision, it's a good idea to allow them to peep in the book because you, your purpose here is revising in a fun way. Not just saying if they win or they lose, you know? Great. Yeah. Well, one of the things, as we sum up some of the ideas that we've talked about today, could you share just this thought uh, with yeah. uh, people watching today? 
Yeah. Well, you know, uh, I'm a psychologist and I'm also been studying neurosciences for, for a very long time. And, you know, from the point of view of neurosciences, but also from the point of view of common sense, emotions are a key, key element in learning. You have to remember that children, and not just children, students in, in general, all your students will not remember you for the material things you provided, but for the feeling that you cherish them. And so playing games, playing games is something that will help you bond with your students, that will help them bond with each other, that will help them work out their differences. If they have problems, uh, social problems, problems will come up in the games and that will give you a great chance to tackle them and to help children who are struggling with social uh, difficulties. And they will have fun and enjoy learning and they won't even realize they are learning. That's the great thing about playing games to learn a language. Students say, oh, the class is over. We did. Sometimes ch children tell you, we didn't do anything today. It's like they feel like doing things is writing, <laughs> copying, doing the boring stuff, you know? Right. It's the best, the best compliment a student can pay to you when they tell you, oh, the class is over. I can't believe it, you know? So in the long run, when they see you years later, they see you in the hallways in the school and they remember the game you play. They remember how you made them feel. They remember how much fun they had in that activity. So right. that's what we need to foster. Great. pleasure relaxation you know fun Absolutely. in the classroom and i know we were talking right before the broadcast of the different websites that provide different learning opportunities yeah. bamboozle uh word wall i think you said esl games plus those yeah. we've linked in the show notes for people to be aware of those online resources feel free to uh share in the uh in in the comments section Feel free to share any website that you have used as well. And if we could just wrap up our comments today for those people that are interested in, in contacting you, reaching out to you and knowing more about your book, what would you like to share? Well, you know, one thing is that um, the book is sold overseas all over the world. So you're, you're uh, more than welcome to, to contact us if you would like more information, more details. Uh, you can contact us through Instagram. You see our Instagram account here at book.games.galore or through Facebook, facebook.com slash book.games.galore or write us an email to infogamesgalore at gmail.com. We will answer as soon as we can and we're glad to provide all the information you, you need. And, and let me say, Randall, that it's been an absolute honor to be invited to this broadcast and to be given the opportunity to to share experiences with teachers from different countries so what you're doing i think is marvelous uh very enriching and enlightening for teachers and also so that we don't feel alone Absolutely. that we're going through the same experiences I think this is one of the first times in history where everybody is experiencing very similar experiences, you know, in teaching. Right. And it's great. Absolutely. And that's one of the purpose of doing such broadcasts to provide yeah. a forum, an opportunity for people to engage, to share Absolutely. their ideas and so forth. Yeah. So Neely, I want to thank you very much for being a part of this broadcast, for sharing your voice and for everyone else out there who has shared yeah. their comments and ideas and we want to well, uh, well, to thank you for joining and wish you a wonderful day and an even better tomorrow. So long. Thank you.